can Jesus raise the dead? Well, that's the question people are asking themselves in Jesus' day, and they're still asking it today. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and our teacher, of course, is Dr. J. Vernon McGee, and he's about to take us to John chapter 11 for some answers to this important theological question. But before we get started, I want to share a letter from a fellow Bible bus passenger named Levon. In 1978, my family moved to Guam due to my husband's assignment with the U.S. Navy. At the time, Transworld Radio was building its transmitter site on the island, and some of the TWR missionaries volunteered as Sunday school teachers at the Navy Chapel. That is where I first heard the name of Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'd been reading the Bible since high school with little understanding, so it was a joy to hear the Bible explained in a way that was simple and clear. That began my journey of studying the entire Bible. I praise God daily for Dr. McGee's teaching. God also blessed me with a dear friend who loves the Word, and together we listen to the programs and discuss what we're learning. When we started, we were young and had young children. Now we are grandmothers, but don't feel old. God's Word brings joy each day and new lessons to be learned. Thank you for continuing the teaching and for the World Prayer Team, which is so informative about the worldwide church and gives us the opportunity to be part of the ministry. Words are inadequate to describe my gratitude to the Lord for your programs. I can only say thank you. Well, thank you, LaVon. What an encouraging letter that is. And we completely agree that God's Word does bring joy each day, and there are always new lessons to be learned and remembered. Now, I want to challenge you. While you're thinking about it, why don't you take a minute and send a note to us and let us know what God's teaching you through our time in His Word. You know, the book of John has so many rich lessons. So let us know how God is using them in your life. Email your note to BibleBus at ttb.org, or you can write to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Now let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the joy and instruction that we receive from your Word. We thank you for all those who are joining us as we study and ask that you turn our hearts toward you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, we have come to the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And actually, you've heard me say this before, that we've come to the high point. I mentioned that, you will recall, back in a preceding chapter. Well, it was the high point up to that point. And the Gospel of John, to me, is like climbing up a mountain, and each chapter brings you a little higher than the other place. And that preceding chapter was the high point up to then. But we're not at the top of the mountain, and I don't think we're at the top of the mountain here in chapter 11, but we have come to a high point. And if you will look at it from this viewpoint, why did John write this gospel? And it might be well for us to state again why he wrote this gospel. He says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. And by the way, that's found in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And we go back to the very beginning, and it started off, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word was made flesh. And when he was made flesh, why, we saw that by miracle and parable and discourse that this great thesis has been sustained. Now, the supreme question that can be asked is this, can Christ raise the dead? And that's the big question in any religion. And friends, that's the big question in this life here. We speak today of the fact that death is a great mystery. Well, this life is a great mystery too. And this life is practically meaningless if there is no resurrection of the dead, and for a Christian, we are of all men most miserable. The question that you'd ask of any religion, does it have power over death? 
Now, liberalism has long ago thrown out the miraculous. And they use, I think, the most illogical argument, anything in the Scripture that's miraculous, that doesn't belong there. Not because of any scholarly reason, but just because they don't believe in the miraculous, you see. Just like a man eating fish, and he doesn't believe in bones. And when he comes to a bone, why, he ignores it. He doesn't believe that fish have bones. He's in trouble. In fact, he might even choke to death. And there's the miraculous in Scripture. You can't throw it out, and you can't get rid of the bodily resurrection. They explain it away, of course, in many ways. There's a substitute teaching, a synthetic doctrine, and you hear it stated like this, I believe in a religion of the here and now, not hereafter. It's pie in the sky, by and by, and we don't go for that. We want a meat and potatoes religion. We want one that's practical and not theoretical. We want one that has practice in it and not doctrine. And you want to know something, that's the kind I want also. But my friend, I want to hope. You see, you get a lot of benefits right here and now. But the greatest benefit is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And it seems to me to be very practical to ask the question, will the dead be raised? Life is so brief. Life's a little day compared to eternity is nothing. And with thousands of boys that have had their lives snuffed out on every battlefield of the world, that's a good question. Will the dead be raised? And I had a funeral of a very wonderful Christian man, and there sat his wife and his mother. May I say to you, they found the resurrection very practical. And when you go out and stand at the graveside, I tell you, if you haven't any hope, you're whistling in the dark and singing in the rain, and you're giving out the blues, you're singing the blues, and all you've got is a rock festival, and I think it's rocks in your head when you get to the place. You have no hope after this life. Now, isms, they make some startling claims, but as far as I know, only one or two of them have ever claimed they can raise the dead. The only thing is they never produce the body, the corpus delecti. Now, the resurrection has to do with the raising of the body. The Lord Jesus, when he sent his disciples out, they were to heal the sick, but they also to raise the dead. When they healed the sick, it was the body in that day, and when they raised the dead, it was the body that was raised. Now, they promised so much here, but nothing hereafter, and that's like giving a baby a rattle to play with while he's in this life. May I say it reminds me of something that, very frankly, I'm afraid a great many people are taking today, and that's an airplane trip. And they tell me that it's more difficult to land a plane than to take off, that actually a novice can take off, but it takes an expert to land a plane. And liberalism and the isms remind me of taking off in a plane with a pilot who takes you up into the clouds and gives you a few thrills. Finally, when the gas runs low, he calmly informs you that he's never landed a plane. In fact, he cannot land one. It was a nice ride while it lasted, but you know it's pretty important to be able to come into the airport, friends. And by the way, I'd ask you the question, you're flying high today? Well, you're going to land one of these days. You've got someone that can bring you into the airport. It's very important. And the supreme test, therefore, is life after death. Personally, if I was looking for a religion, I'd want to know what a religion has to say about this, and I'd want a modicum of proof. Now, there are in the Gospels three recorded instances of Christ raising the dead. Actually, both Peter and Paul raised the dead. And the great hope of the Christian faith is the resurrection of the dead. Of the three instances in the gospel, the synoptic gospels, the first three give about the little girl raised from the dead. Only Luke gives about the little girl and the widow's son of Nain. 
And now only John gives the account of the resurrection of Lazarus. If you put these three together, you'll find out the Lord Jesus raised the little girl, and that is a child. And then he raised a young man, the widow's son of Nain, and then he raised Lazarus, and he was an old man, I think. And so you have our Lord in the resurrection. We'll have no separation, generation gap of children being sent to one department, the young married sent to another, the old people put in a retirement home. They're all going to be raised together. And I would say hallelujah to that. We talk about the breakdown today of races. There's a breakdown today in age groups that I think the church has promoted that is almost sinful. But you see, I'm a retired preacher now. And I don't know why a retired preacher becomes an expert on everything that he didn't do himself. Well, let me begin reading now. I wanted you to have this introduction to this very marvelous chapter. Now, notice, I'm reading John 11, verse 1. Now, a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. You notice that it's the town of Mary, and when you get into the home, which I think we'll be visiting, it was the home of Martha. She had charge of the kitchen and all of that, but the town belonged to Mary. Those are different gifts. Some women are given a marvelous gift in the home, and you talk about a woman's liberation movement. I don't know of anyone that's the big boss any more than a wife and her mother in a home. She has full charge of the kitchen and of the rest of the house. And she hustles you out of the kitchen, makes you get out of the ice box, and tells you to get outside. She's going to vacuum the rug and get out of bed that she wants to get busy. May I say to you that some women, that's their calling, Christian women. And there are others that have an outside ministry. They teach Bible classes, child evangelism, work in the church. And because your neighbor doesn't work in the church, friend, doesn't mean that she's not serving the Lord. And because these women working outside don't work in their home more doesn't mean they're not serving the Lord by any means. And so it's the town of Mary, but it was the home actually of Martha. And will you notice, it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. In other words, John is identifying this home for us by telling us this. We'll visit that home ourselves later, and it's a wonderful home to visit. Now will you notice, therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, Behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. This is an humble home. We know that. Poor folks' home, please. And this is a story that's just filled with tenderness and sweetness. And will you notice that this man Lazarus is also identified? He's the one Jesus loved. Well, what about Paul? (laughs) Well, Paul said he loved me. And what about John? John said he loved us, and Peter said that he loved us. And by the way, he loves you, and he loves me. So it can be said today, the one whom thou lovest is sick. And that's a child of God anywhere. And notice, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified. Now, Jesus was not present at the time. He was away. And he tells his disciples, though, he says, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. In other words, it's interesting to note that these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, This miracle is performed for the glory of God. Now, will you notice verse 5? Now, Jesus loved Martha and his sister and Lazarus. He loved the whole family, loves your family, friend. And I don't care whether you're a Christian or not. He loves you. You can't keep him from loving you, but you sure can 
put up an umbrella to keep the love of God from entering your life. You can't keep the sun from shining, but you sure can put up an umbrella and get out of the sunshine. Now, will you notice? I'm reading now verse 6. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Now, he did that deliberately and purposely. And sometimes he lets one of his own die. <laughs> when his own dies, really, he's just calling him home. That's all. He's just saying, come on home now. And Lazarus died. But this is all for a purpose. All this is written for you and me. We might believe. Now he says, verse 7, Then after that saith he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. Don't miss that again. He'd been there. He'd had to withdraw because of the opposition. Now he has returned. And will you notice? His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. And goest thou thither again? And he's going again. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there's no light in him. Now, what is he saying here? And very candidly, I personally think he's saying something here that's quite wonderful. And that is that as long as he's in the world, he'll be the light of the world. And he came as the light of the world. And if there's to be light in Bethany in the time of death, Jesus must be there. Therefore, he said, that's the reason we're going, because while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And it's daytime now, and the night's coming when no man can work. Tremendous statement he's making here. Now, he goes on to say, but if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there's no light in him. He doesn't want these sisters to be hopeless and helpless, so he's going to them. Now, verse 11, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. What he's talking about is death. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. Now, you see, Christ waited that he might raise Lazarus from the dead. And the disciples misunderstood now what Christ meant by sleep. And a great many misunderstand today. Death for a believer has a new name. It's been robbed of its terror. And the sting is gone. And resurrection always refers to the body, you see. And it's the body that is put to sleep. It's the body that is raised. And death for a believer is asleep as far as the body is concerned. But sleep never refers to the soul or the spirit of man. There's no such thing as soul sleep, therefore. And it's the body that dies. It's the body that is going to be raised from the dead. You see, the word for resurrection is anastasis, means to stand up. And as C.S. Lewis, that brilliant Oxford don, ridiculed the liberal, he said, when a spirit stands up, what position does he get in? That's one for you to work over, by the way. And resurrection means the standing up, and it always refers to the body. Soul never dies. Therefore, the soul never sleeps. Death is a reality, and it's an awful reality. It's of the body. And death means separation, and it means the body of the believer goes into the grave, and that body's put to sleep because it's going to be raised one of these days. But the individual goes to be with Christ, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now, the resurrection is a reality. Buddhism talks about the resurrection of the soul. Some of the isms today talk about it. Now, my friend, whether you are saved or lost, you're going into eternity. And a great many today would like to believe death is extinction. As a man said to me here in Pasadena, he said, you know, when you die, you're just like a dog. I said, don't you wish that was true? But I said, if it's not true, and I think that bothers you a little, 
you're in trouble, aren't you? Well, he said, we'll not talk about that. No, I don't want to talk about that, friends, because it's an awful reality. Now, will you notice our Lord makes very clear what he meant by sleep. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought he'd spoken of taking a rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And that's the awful stark reality that comes to life in life today. It's quite interesting that when Nasser died, you'll recall the great grief of the Arab world. And they said, Nasser is dead. Gamal, Gamal, what will we do now? And so immediately the leadership, they had no hope to offer the people, but they said this, don't grieve for Nasser, he's dead. And believe me, he was. But his ideas and his theories are still alive, and they'll live on. What a hope. That's not much of a hope, is it? But that was the only hope they have. Miss McGee and I were in Wichita, Kansas, in a Bible conference, and staying at a very large and very fine motel there. And when that football team took off on that Friday, and then word came in that afternoon that one of the planes was down, and the first string football players were in it, and the coach, and they'd all been killed. It was quite interesting. At the motel in the bar room, they had what they call a happy hour. Oh, it was a happy hour, they called it. And when we would come in of an afternoon to get ready for the evening service, why we would hear, oh my, the noise that was coming out of the happy hour place. You know that evening, well, I thought we were in a morgue when we walked in the place. And then when we went in the dining room to eat, we could overhear conversation. Tragedy, yes, it was a tragedy, but no hope, friends, no hope. Lazarus is dead. And someday, those words will be probably brought to you about a loved one. What about your hope? What about your relationship to God today? Do you have any hope at all? Now he says, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Oh, Thomas is a gloom caster, isn't he? He thinks that he's going to die also. But thank God he was willing to, I think very much like Simon Peter, when they came right down to it. Simon Peter denied the Lord, and I think Thomas would have too. I don't think his human nature is any better than Simon Peter's, and ours is not any better either. But for the grace of God, we had denied. And when you hear today of the failure of a Christian, and the other day, I heard about another preacher walked out of the pulpit and he said, I'm through. I'm through. <laughs> How tragic it is to see men falling by the wayside, churches falling by the wayside, turning away from the faith. They once stood for something, but no longer. Well, I'm going to leave right off there today and we'll pick up tomorrow because we're going to see that the Lord Jesus and his disciples are going to Bethany, and something very wonderful will take place in Bethany. May God richly bless you, my beloved. I hope that you'll join us to see what's going to take place. Until then, you can find tons of great resources that'll deepen your personal study of God's Word when you visit the resources section of our website, ttb.org. And while you're there, be sure you don't miss our new Bible companion for John. Again, it's available for free download at ttb.org. And we always love hearing from you. So call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And of course, you can always reach us by mail at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. Or in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. And when you contact us, don't forget to tell us how you listen to Through the Bible. There are so many different options, from our new app to podcasts, our online archives, radio station listings, and so much more. So be sure to tell us what your preference is. 
this little bit of information really does help us make important ministry decisions and then to be good stewards of the resources that God has provided from faithful friends like you. So be sure to tell us when you call or write. I'm Steve Schwetz. As always, grateful for your presence on the Bible bus and your partnership in taking God's whole word to his whole world. Jesus made it all, all to be my home. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Through the Bible is a five year study of God's entire word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?